introducing the institution of surveyors of Kenya live stream and live chat. Do you have a question from any of the following areas? Land survey, valuation, building survey, land administration, engineering survey, estate agency, property management, and geospatial information management. Join the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya live stream and live chat every Friday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ISK Facebook live chat this Friday afternoon, the 10th of July, 2020. This activity happens every Friday. And this particular Friday, our theme is enhancing maintenance management and safety of buildings, whether they are private or public owned. We would encourage members to field questions and there are various channels for doing that. Uh, the first one is uh, we have a website www.isk.or.ke The second one is the WhatsApp. Our number is 0724 929 737 and our email is info at isk.or.ke please feel welcome to field questions with us uh, i have uh, a program here a little bit and i would like to share with you the first thing of course is introduction of self and the subject but today is not about me so i'll talk very little about me i'll talk more about the Building Surveyors Registration Board, which is the newest kid on the block at ISK. I'll also talk about the building itself. What exactly is maintenance? What is the management of maintenance? It has come some way, because from just a rag attack thing to a scientific approach to the way we manage buildings, for very many reasons. And I think that even the COVID-19 has helped us to want to deal with things more systematically. The public buildings, for example, like hospitals, it has been indicated that a lot of our hospitals do not have sufficient facilities. And it would be nice to take stock of what they don't have, what they have, and how we can help. We are the building surveyors. I'll take the opportunity to also um, talk about who is a building surveyor. And uh, I'm one of them. There are several others. But the background of this is that most building surveyors are actually in government. Because the government has the most number of buildings in this country. Way back in 1974, the government decided to hire the first building surveyors. And the intention was for government, which recognized that its investment in real estate is so humongous. We are talking trillions of shillings invested all over the country. Offices, downtown things, name it, institutions, schools, colleges, hospitals, name it. Even military barracks, for heaven's sake, prisons, police stations, name it. There are so many that government has interest in. And this needs to be maintained. I'll be talking to you shortly about what I mean by maintenance. And for the avoidance of doubt, I will actually quote the British Standards Institution and also quote the Indian Standards Institution. We are here to develop our own here in Kenya, but we are ambitious enough that in the very near future, especially with the formation of the Building Surveyors Registration Board, that we'll actually have our own standards. Or maybe just make a hybrid instead of um, uh, you know, in reinventing the wheel, what we'll do is take what's best from the British standards, take what's best from the Indian standards, and have a hybrid. So that we, what we have will be a superior product. So, let me start with myself. I am a, a University of Nairobi graduate of 1980. I studied land economy, and immediately after that, joined the Ministry of Public Works. I was posted to Mombasa, and I was responsible for the buildings throughout the coast province, all those six then districts, you know. 
Taito Taveta, Nemin, uh, Tana River, Kwale, Kilifi, Mombasa, name them, all those. And I had a whole team of technicians, inspectors, drivers, and vehicles. So I had infrastructure. And with that, we were able to then address the various maintenance needs in the various interests in government. And it was not small change. It was big budget. We had dedicated officers. And just so you know, we also were responsible for State House in Mombasa, which was a favorite of the late president, Jomo Kenyatta, and President Moi also used it quite a bit. So our role there was to assure that the need for maintenance of the buildings is addressed. And we can break down that into four aspects. The one is about convenience. How convenient is the building you are staying in? And then how comfortable is it? And then as we go down, we'll say, how safe is it? How safe? You know, can anybody using it? Could it be a child? Uh, could it be ladies, maybe even expectant mothers? Could it be people with disabilities? Are they able to use the building comfortably and conveniently? And of course, of late, we have had this challenge of security, where buildings in this country have been the victims of terrorist attacks. Our buildings need to be, as people design buildings, they need to, in their mind, to know that they, that should be a factor. So, if you look at the way our buildings are today, whether they are privately owned or publicly owned, I'll leave it to you, you are the best judge. Do they meet the standards that you want, based on those four? about convenience, about comfort, about safety, and about security. Do you think they do? We do have the building code in Kenya, which we are currently revising. And that we'll talk about that sometime. But meanwhile, even if we have that code, which is a law by itself, do we even adhere to it? Do we obey it? Do we have enough people to supervise that the buildings are meeting the compliance? as per law established. So let me just define what I mean by maintenance. And uh, I'll use the British standards uh, 3811 of 1974, which says it's the combination of all technical and assorted administrative actions taken to retain an item in order or restore it to a state in which it can perform its required function. That is the BS standard. I'll take the liberty of also sharing the Government of India's Committee of Maintenance, which says building maintenance is work undertaken to keep, restore, or improve every facility. That is to say, every part of a building, its services, and even the surroundings, to, and I like this bit, a currently acceptable standard, where we mean that it should sustain the utility of the intended building, the parts in there, if it's a toilet, if it's a living, if it's a kitchen, that it's actually meeting those. And of course, sustain the value of what has been invested in it. In others, we are looking at, is there going to be a return on investment? You know, some people get mistaken when they hear about maintenance, they look at it as a drain on legitimate revenue or income. It's not. It's part of how you are actually sustaining what you have spent so much time money, sweat, blood, and even tears to put up. Would you like that to be wasted? Or would you like it to maintain the standard to which it can serve the intended purpose? So if you look at that, then you say, it's been in light of the COVID-19, I've identified what I call the key risk indicators, the things that will show us what are some of the issues that would worry us about. And in a nutshell, I would say one of them is access, the buildings. Uh, the other day, people were referred to quarantines, and they could not access those. Why? Because there was a staircase. And how do you carry a, a, a trolley up a staircase? You know? So, and then the other thing, which is even perhaps more critical, is that we'll zero in on public buildings which have 
bigger uses. For example, schools. Schools should be one place which is safe for everybody, including our children and their teachers. So that means that it should be designed and built in such a way that's easy to get in, and in the event of an eventuality, in the event of any incident, it should also be easy for the children and the teacher to safely get out. It's not always that way. The same applies to colleges. And even colleges have got many more students. Of course, they are older, they are mature, they are more responsible. But in the event of an incident, we all want self-preservation. No one thinks, oh, because I'm older, I should just walk out of a danger. People will be running. Can we facilitate that? And I'm thinking we as building surveyors have a role to play here because the building surveyor actually takes over from the design and the production of the building. The building has been done, it's now being used and that's where the building surveyor comes in. And you might ask yourself, why don't you have the building surveyor maybe sit in the design team? Why do I say that? Because the building surveyor would have used that building, seen how some of the challenges of the components, of the services, of the utilities, how comfortable it is to access anything. How do you, there was this rather laughable story about Buruburu phase one and two, where people needed to put their furniture, particularly beds, through the roof because of the design. And I'm not taking into an architect, those are our fellow uh, professionals, but the, there is a mismatch between what is intended and actually what comes out as a building. Um, then, of course, so I, I like here at this stage to just maybe focus on first residential because it's easier. Because residential usually will just be a family, and uh, you know, so everybody knows everybody. And the government, in its wisdom, using the building code, has recommended a certain number of people per space. But again, having said that, we are not. We can't limit it there because the majority of Kenyans, I'm looking at about easily 60%, live in informal settlements. My preferred term for that is not informal settlements. My preferred term is community settlements. Because believe it or not, whether you live in a big house, a mansion, or whatever, and the people who live in the informal settlements, each of us call that place home. When you go there, you are just intent to rest after toiling the whole day. The truth is, the people who live in the informal settlements, you call them informal, I call them homes, they call that home. And they'll get as good sleep as the people who are living in a six-bedroom house somewhere in Lavington. Again, there's no difference between the two, I mean, in the eyes of God, they are all his children. And we just want to set standards, so that especially with this challenge of COVID-19, that where we are saying there should be social distance of one and a half meters. Some places in Madare and Mkibra need to be reviewed because it's difficult for that family to actually have social distance of that. And we need to be alive to the fact those citizens are contributing to the economy as much as any other citizen. And so we would like, in the fullness of time, to engage maybe the tenants and the landlords of this and see how we can possibly expand the, the space so that when people, the family is living there, they have the necessary comfort and safety and health for all. Because again, these same people are those who provide labor for the upmarket places. So when they are affected, it also affects the people in the upmarket. So let's not uh, uh, wash it away and say, here in Shaoriao. It's not Shaoriao. It shall relate to Zote. We need to be like the Bible says, to be our sisters or brother's keeper. So, uh, the other thing that I feel is key in this discussion is how the, the, the ventilation, for example, because we are talking about, uh, especially in COVID-19, that there should be fresh air coming in, there should be less uh, moist moisture, there should be less humid anything, in fact, I was watching on telly yesterday and they were saying air conditioning is not recommended for people who have COVID-19 because the air then does not circulate 
freshly and so on. So those are design factors that will be employed to assure that every citizen has a minimum standard of comfort, of convenience, and to meet the health standards that have been set, and the safety standards, and also, of course, security standards when it happens. Um, let's now just dichotomize this building, and let's for a moment talk about commercial buildings. And there are various types of commercial buildings. We have offices, that's the most common. We have uh, factories. We have warehouses. We have, for crying out loud, we even have stadia. That's also a place where many people come together. How secure are those? And we are saying, especially the place like a, a supermarket, it has to be convenient for the person using it and convenient for the person owning the business. So there is a win-win. What happens sometimes is you find that in the, in the case of trying, the event of trying to get maximum profit or maximum usage of space, sometimes we infringe on the, the light rights of Kenyans in the space usage. A good case in point is the downtown Nakumat incident where there was a fire and it turned out that people could not escape because what has, had been an escape route, clearly marked escape route, actually had been blocked off. Why was it blocked off? Because people, the owner of the business feared for maybe theft or whatever it is. But there must be a more creative way of preventing theft. Because what happened, a lot of people were trying to get out and when they got to the exit, there was no actually no exit. So hypothetically, that already is illegal. And if, ask me, I'm not a lawyer, but I would say people could be sued for millions and millions of shillings for not having the opportunity to escape. Again, just on the same Nakumata incident, uh, is the issue of was there enough fire, enough, enough water to put out the fire? And it turns out, no, the water hydrant outside was not sufficient. So even as the people from the private sector and the, the, the city council then were trying to work together, they didn't have enough water. So they had the infrastructure, but did not include water. That is tragic. That is really tragic. Also, looking at the same thing about incidents like that, let's take, for example, during the, 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 the Duzit Hotel attack, which was, of course, not, an ex not expected and so on. But can we ask ourselves fairly and say, are people prepared? Do they conduct drills? Do they work out regularly just so that when it, something like that happens, they know where to run, how to run, how to go low and so on? Or will they just walk into a bullet, as happened in Duzit and also in Westgate? People had no, of course, during panic, there's really no sure fire. People get, uh, they even lose their cool. And in the process, you find that many people, many deaths, particularly of children, uh, one, uh, could have been avoided if there had been drills, if there had been education system continuously, not just one one off, but on a regular basis, I would recommend every two months, there should be a drill. And everybody gets to know what they're supposed to do. The collection center, where they can then do a drill, where they can do a roll call, to assure themselves that everybody is accounted for. It's, it's, uh, the building surveying is such a, 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 an exciting undertaking that no day is the same as the previous one. Today you go in, you just want to do whatever train, you know, maybe you want to do conduct painting, maybe you want to talk to your customers and you find something else has happened. Maybe there's a flood and you have to deal with it. So the one of the things that really makes it exciting is that you find things happen in a way that you can never, ever predict, not using your head. You have to be scientific. You have to work in with things like um, the, the aspects of maintenance, which work on prevention. And I'll be expanding on that, that when it comes to maintenance, there are, there are types of maintenance that we'll talk about. The first one, is of course uh, what I would call routine maintenance. You know, where there's cleaning, if it's a building, every day a public building should be cleaned because it's used every day. 
if it's um, a supermarket, again, it should be cleaned daily basis. If it's, um, uh, say, an office, equally, and an office block is not just a building, it also has services. It has lifts, it has toilets, it has, name it, it has a lot of equipment that needs to be taken care of. And we need to have a maintenance plan for doing that. Preferably, preventive maintenance, rather than waiting for things to break down. Because that means that you're going to spend more money and you could even be sued if, if, if an accident happens in the premises which could have been prevented. So that is about routine maintenance. And um, when buildings are put up, I would recommend that there should be manuals for each part so that everybody knows what they are supposed to do, how regularly they are supposed to do what I would call preventive maintenance, how regularly they are supposed to review, how regularly they are supposed to if, for example, it's um, a generator, that it periodically it's re reviewed, it's sorted out, and so on. And then you find, yeah, people are better. But I think one of the key challenges that we face in this country is the assume and interpret. We assume that everybody knows, which is false economy. Rather than saying everybody knows, it's better we want to use, I'll use that analogy of the aircraft. It doesn't matter how often you've flown, they'll always go through the drill of showing you how you're supposed to act in the event, in the, they call it in the unlikely event of an incident, if you have trash out and so on. How you wear those masks, how you'll get the oxygen flowing and so on and so on. And how you'll take care of yourself and then take care of your neighbor. So all these things you find that Maybe we could borrow a leaf from the way aircraft are maintained. The difference being that when an aircraft takes off, it doesn't have anybody up there to take care of it. So a lot of the preparation, a lot of the pre maintenance and so on is done on the ground. Whereas, and sometimes you look at this like a joke, but it isn't. If it's a building and it happens to be to have an incident, let's say it's a leaking roof, it's easy. You just move your bed to another space nearby and you continue sleeping. The people in the air don't have that luxury. And I, I was talking to our board, the Building Surveyors Registration Board, and saying, why don't we be ambitious enough and say, let's see how the people who manufacture aircraft, what kind of maintenance uh, policy and philosophy they have. They must take into account the fact that A, they're carrying human beings. B, there's no second chance when that happens. You know, once you're gone, You've flown, you've flown, you'll just be lucky if there's an incident, if you come back alive. So why not work on prevention? Why not work on ways to assure that an aircraft is guaranteed safety in the air, on the ground? And the same token, buildings should also be guaranteed their safety on the ground. Well, most of them are on the ground. But you know, these days we have very many high-rise buildings. And I don't see as if really, really, that they have taken into consideration the idea of safety, the idea of easy escape, the idea of choice of materials in construction. Again, let's face it, sometimes the type of material you've chosen is one thing. You might find that the, the different kinds of materials are not compatible with each other. Case in point, you might find that uh, certain wiring if it's exposed to a certain temperature, it becomes risky and with, in no time it can cause a fire. It's been known that up to maybe, maybe at least 40% of fires in this city are caused through electrical faults. And we are recommending as Building Surveyors Registration Board that there should be standards. If it's a matter of wiring, the wiring must be replaced after a certain period. And before that, at every three months, the wiring is inspected. You have to assure yourself, yes, the wiring is safe, no rats. You know, again, we have rodents in some of these homes and some of the office buildings, even factories and so on, especially if it's manufacturing food. So you'll find that there could be rodents, rats, mice. They could come and nip the wiring and make it exposed without us realizing. That's, that hence the need 
for very regular inspection. Inspection, not just, just inspection, but equally for somebody, whoever the professional is that is inspecting, to actually issue a certificate that this is fit for purpose. They take responsibility. That way, they'll not do it casually. They'll know that whatever they do, it's their, 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 their name online, and they'll be culpable in the event of something happening. Because of the number of people in buildings, in commercial buildings, let's focus more on that. Not that residential is less important, but there are fewer people and it's easier to manage. Whereas commercial buildings have all sorts of people coming together from different kind of backgrounds, and in the event of a, an incident, it's very difficult to manage them if there's no adequate preparation. Uh, so, you know, there are people who have talked about disaster resilience. How do we cope with disaster? And uh, the Hugo framework of action says disaster resilience is determined by the degree to which individuals, communities, and public and private organizations are capable of organizing themselves to learn from past incidents, from past disasters, and reduce their risks in future ones at international, regional, national, even household level. And here, if you ask me, we've had challenges. This year alone, apart from COVID-19, which is still an ongoing challenge, we had locusts. Most locusts don't come to house, houses, but they somehow they infringe on where you're going to keep your crop, where you're going to feed your food, and so on. We also had challenges of drought, which is fine. But the opposite of that were floods. We had so much floods, and a lot of buildings could not resist those floods. In the process, Kenyans lost their lives. Some lost their livelihoods. Some lost all their property, and so on. So really, in terms of resilience, we are saying, is there some way we could be better prepared? And how do you do that? By just you know, working, knowing that, yes, an incident will happen. And when a system like that, an issue like that happens, it causes shocks and also causes stress. Are we ready for that? How can we prepare for that? And it's a, it's, it's a factor of three things. One is the exposure. The other one is the sensitivity and our adaptive capacity. How quickly can we recover and continue operating? If, for example, it's a business. How quickly, if it's a bank, and I worked in the bank some time back, the arrangement is to have uh, another a site off the premises of the bank. The idea being that customers should not be inconvenienced. In the event of something happening in that building, they should just go to the other side and be able to continue serving customers. In principle, it sounds easy, sounds comfortable, but unless it's practiced regularly and frequently, sometimes you can miss the boat. So the key here is preparation. How do you do that? There is a way we've designed what they call a risk assessment matrix. You know, A on the one hand is uh, the likelihood of something happening, and on the other hand is the likely impact when and if it happens. And um, scientific ways of analyzing so that you are uh, confident that when something like that happens, you've covered it. If, it's, if the chances, the impact is minimal, you might, the insurers say, talk about absorbing that risk. But if it's something that you feel would be majorly, would affect your business, would affect lives and so on, the best thing to do is ensure it. Get an insurance assessment, ensure it properly, so that everybody who's using it is comfortable with it. So it's that metrics about the probability of something happening and the likelihood of its its impact. So on the one on the one side we have the if it's tolerable, if it's acceptable, if it's not acceptable, then we have to be prepared better. The life cycle of a building. You know, buildings are exposed to all sorts of things. The weather, that's one, that's the natural one. And you, there are all many possible uses. 
Further, there would be various in-building arrangements inviting various decaying agents to act. For example, if somebody uh, forgot to turn off a tap, the water runs, affects something else, and affects something else. So it might look like just an inconvenience, but if that water touches a live wire, then we are talking about a matter of life and death. It's actually dangerous. And those are the areas where we are saying it needs to be prepared. What do you consider when, you know, talking at a building business continuity plan? One of the issues you want to take into account is what are the utilities? Are they okay? Are they accessible? Are they serviceable? Two, critical equipment. Is it there? Is it serviceable? Has it been maintained? Does it have a logbook? So it, you are, if, or even you as the building manager, when you walk around, you can look at a logbook and say, yeah, this was serviced last week, it's signed, and I'm comfortable with it. The supply chain, it's a business supply chain, you have, because you want to continue doing business, so the supply chain is one of those areas you have to take into account when planning about that the possibility of your incident. Most critical and perhaps usually ignored are the staff themselves. The people, it's not the machines, it's the people who run those machines, the people who serve us, who serve the customer. They too must not be neglected or ignored. They need to be taken into account, they need to be uh, trained, sometimes the extent of actually educating them. So they know what to do, what if an incident happens. We've heard how people, uh, when there's a fire, uh, they are not aware or they don't know that they should actually go as low on the ground as possible. Because what happens is that down there, because smoke is rising and so on, so down there is a safest space. And then of course crawl out. And here again the issue of design. How far, what's the distance between uh, any part of the building and the exit? And the building code talks about I think it's 15 meters. And you ask yourself, is that correct or shall we review it? And the time has come to review some of these laws. There's a business continuity uh, life cycle that we will talk about as a building surveyors. And we are saying the first thing is identify the risk assessment. Key risk indicators. I've talked about that, but I'll talk about it again. Then analyze it. Analyze it. What's the business impact analysis of whatever it is that you have identified? Then step three is create a strategy and plan development of how you'll deal with that incident if it happens. Four is through, you take measurement. You, in other words, you test, you train, and then you maintain. Test, train, and maintain. What do I mean here? Assure yourself that the services are okay. They, they are meeting the standards agreed and so on and that people can, ex uh, can exit quickly and easily to a point where they'll do that. Uh, also, just because we are talking about a professional undertaking here and uh, I really would like to share that because uh, so. so answer the following questions. Who are we? What makes us unique? You know? Define the business protocols, mitigate internal controls, understand management of out of norm circumstances like the ones we have now of COVID-19. In the old school of management, which is still the same, it's management by exception. What's, you know, many things just happen, that's all right. But you should be looking out for a, a, an odd one. What's the odd thing and how are we prepared for that, okay? Then you create critical partnerships because a lot of the things you can't have all the expertise in-house but as a building surveyor you should be in a position to call someone at the very quick and ask them to come and sort out something of a special nature maybe a civil engineer could be a services engineer maybe you know those kind of people but you should be assured that they are accessible and they are aware that you can call them in fact there's a term for it. There's something called a service level agreement, where you are now, you enter into an agreement with somebody, you give them a small retainer on condition that when you need them, 
they'll be available. And then when the, internally, you have to develop education plans. And this, when you are developing an education plan, is not something you just write and then put on a shelf. It's something you want to work on, on a continuous basis. Like the Japanese talk, they talk about Kaizen. That every day you learn something new that will improve the nature of your business and the safety standards of where you are operating that business. And then, most critical, you practice. You practice, you test, you practice, you test, and then you adjust accordingly. How, for example, you know, we talked about exit. Get a normal, I mean, a two, two leg, a person, a normal, so-called, allow me to use the word normal, could take maybe one minute to get to the nearest exit. What if it's somebody with a disability? Do you have a way of facilitating for them to get the, where they need to be, you know, and so on. So, very key, okay? And um, so as we go along, I would just like to discuss a little bit about the other aspects of maintenance. There's something called correctional maintenance. And the difference between correctional maintenance and, and the other types of maintenance is that in the one, you actually have a facility which has already broken down. It could be a, a lift, could be, but also you could have a situation where something you can use as you, are, as you continue, you know, you repair or you do remedial maintenance, but you're still using it. It's not always easy to do that, but it has to be done. And, uh, you know, a building is made up of so many parts that you can't really promise yourself that each part will work the way you want. Because when they combine, you find uh, those of us who study the physics and the chemistry will say some things are catalytic. It's a catalyst for something else to happen, you know. So you can't just sit there. You need to work on a way of assuring yourself that certain materials are compatible with others. Certain components are compatible with others. And in the middle of all this, we are saying, are we working to make sure that technology we are employing technology to assure ourselves that the buildings are up to the modern standard. Do they meet the latest test in terms, for example, of a technology? We are talking about are they, are they wired to where you can now have um, internet? Are they wired where if you wish to have a CCTV, are they available? And so on. And, uh, when it comes to individual pieces of, 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 of components of a building, again, they, some are designed and made to last a lifetime. Timber, for example, is expected to last at least five decades. But the assumption is that it will uh, be painted, it will be cleaned, uh, and so on. And uh, you know, in that way, you'll find that yes, even after the five decades, it will be just as good as new. The paintwork will be good and so on. If on the other hand, there is uh, no renewal of surface painting, the timber would show signs of decay early and its strength after five decades will be much less than was assumed. Again, I, I, I just feel that uh, it will not be fair to continue this discussion without identifying how the upkeep of a building can be realized. There are certain parts of a building that need daily cleaning, daily wiping. That's why people, organizations employ uh, cleaning companies. And I think some of the biggest businesses in this country are cleaning businesses. Why? Because people want the cleanest part. And it's not for nothing that they want that. They want to impress the customer. They want to make sure that the staff are also clean and they're secure and safe when they breathe in things like that. And most of all, they also want to make sure that they are complying with the law. Because the law gives certain requirements. And if you're not meeting those requirements, the, the, the public health ent entities could actually come and close the business. You don't want to risk that. Okay? So, uh, in terms of like cleaning the floor and walls, not only by brushes, but also swabbing daily and regularly, as may be required twice or even three times in cases of hospitals. 
again we have COVID-19 with us. So I'll keep going back to COVID-19 and say, is there a routine written down that indicates how regularly is this hospital facility being cleaned to assure that it's good and ready to receive a customer or in this case a patient anytime they need it. Yes. Non-cleaning would allow dirt and dust to be accumulated which causes decay. But equally the dust itself will be risky to the patients when they come in. In the case of COVID-19 this can even be more frequent because you have removing one patient who probably has uh, recovered and you are getting another one. So you need to be assured that the, the facility is of the same standard in terms of safety, in terms of health. In water closets, this should be cleaned by brush and at least once in a week by acid or any other commercial, commercially available cleaning chemicals. This is very important. In cleaning of the sanitary installations and premises, they must be followed by spreading detergent powder or by detergent liquid on hygienic ground. Why? Again, COVID-19. We every day we are seeing people saying, "Keep your mask on, uh, keep distance, wash your hands." If the surface you are touching or you are using is not properly cleaned or well cleaned and sanitized, there is the risk of getting the virus. And we know, indeed, that some Kenyans have lost their lives needlessly because this is something which is preventable if they just follow those three rules from the Ministry of Health. But it's not always easy, particularly because we use public transport. How do you guarantee who is your neighbor? Are they safe to be with? Are they, you know, you don't start taking the temperature of your neighbor on a public transport. So really, looking for, going, going forward, we should say, let's look at the value chain of an individual from the time they wake up. They go to the bathroom, they have breakfast, there's a table, then they go into the field and out there they are meeting anybody. So uh, the minister was very clear about this, that it's our personal responsibility to assure that we, we, are, we have done all the three major issues. And then of course, once we are assured that we are clean and secure, then maybe we can look at the neighbor. But again, Kenya being a free country, I can't imagine that we start telling somebody, why are you not wearing a mask? They might consider it rude, you know, and so on. Yes? Back to the building. Glass panes of doors and windows are to be cleaned properly and at least once in a week with the help of liquid cleaners which are available commercially. What are these places where they need to be cleaned weekly. The rooftop should be cleaned weekly. Why? Because if debris comes, as the rains come and so on, it will have it will affect the way the roof operates. And not just the roof that is deteriorating, it will cause a severe structural damage if the water percolates and sits somewhere. Bathrooms and bathing places should be cleaned by flushing two or three buckets of hot water at least once every week. This will loosen up oil and fat particles clogging in the trap. Earth and ashes should not be used for cleaning the utensils as this would cause chockage of the trap and ultimately shorten the life of a component. The doors and windows may be given an easy sound of hinges indicating oiling is required. This should be done weekly, although I think in this country hardly anyone would want to oil their, their windows or their, their doors every week. So I think to be practical, let's say maybe every quarter, you know, and this is something we can do ourselves. That I think sometimes there are a lot of these, what they call DIY, things we can do for ourselves. It really helps for us, not just to understand our building, because that's where you live, and that's home, but so that you can also save something in the event of an emergency. You should be able to deal with that. Then the ventilation installations need to be checked very regularly and cleaned and oiled once every week. Again, I would say once every three weeks or every three months. There are the things like electric pumps and motor installa installations. This need to be checked regularly and the performance not in, in a logbook. You know, and this, there's no compromise on this because there's a risk there of that catching fire when it comes to electrical things.
Heavy electrical installations like transformers, switch gears need to be examined by a qualified engineer regularly. And this is the role of the building surveyor is to make sure that that actually happens. It's part of the management process. And we are looking at the return on the investment in that respect. In case of oil-based transformers, the level of oil must be checked. We don't want to drive the transformer to the ground and then check the oil. It's better if you do it in a good time. The decorations inside and outside are to be cleaned properly at least once every quarter. Leaks can be observed in soil pipes, waste paper, waste pipes and rainwater pipes, specific, especially a portion running horizontally. So there needs to be a fall, brought to fall, so that it moves, that, that the wastewater moves and cleans itself. The water supply line also needs to be checked very regularly. Cleaning of the water reservoirs, both at ground and overhead, needs to be done again regularly. We are looking at preventive maintenance, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've seen how often does it happen that when there is rain in this city, you find drainages are blocked. Why? Because we don't have that regular routine maintenance where we go and just clear what is, you know, so easily cleanable. We should have a method. Maybe with the military taking over the city, perhaps we are going to see some change in that respect because the rumor has it that they are very thorough about the things they want to do. But it's no excuse. We should not wait for the military. We should be able to do it ourselves, do it well, as an example, you know. Sometimes there are those narrow hair cracks which may observe the walls. This should be dug out and cleaned properly. Also, there's a growth of small plants. You, you, I think most people in their homes, you find there are small plants on the wall. Remove them. Don't wait for it to break the wall, okay? Plastering on the wall, both internal and external, and ceilings at places showing bulge or cracks. These need to be checked. You can have uh, what they call telltale glass, which you put on the crack, and if it's growing, the, crust, the glass will break. Painting internal and externally, external surfaces of buildings is essential for reasons of hygiene. I'm almost like repeating myself here. Protection of the structure and the aesthetics. The rendering on the surface protects the structure, but it, it is porous and absorbs moisture, which causes permanent damage in the walls and ultimately affects the structure seriously. The external painting, cement-based paint or color, wash with lime, seals, the pores of the plaster and protect, it protects the structure. Renewal of the internal wall painting is desirable annually and that of the external wall every four years. But here again, let's qualify this. If it's a hospital, we can't wait for a year to paint it. It should be done more frequently, more regularly to assure that it's clean and it's meeting the standards required. Painting of doors and windows and water supply and Drainage lines is to be done periodically at intervals of not more than four years. Why? Because again, the surfaces deteriorate because they are exposed to the weather elements. The insulations, either sound or heat, if exi they exist, need to be checked for any leakages. If observed, they should be repaired immediately. Electrical installations, internal wiring, switches, fans, water heaters are to be checked to find out if there's any leakage spot which is common in old buildings. Now it sounds like when you say old buildings, you'd say, you think, oh, old buildings, they have everything. No, old buildings have other advantages. If you check old buildings in this town, they have a lot of space, more than the newer buildings, you know? And so these are to be cleaned regularly at regular intervals. The wiring is to be replaced once in two decades without fail. This is one of those areas where we actually need to have a certification. Because again, what happens when there's no certification, there's no guarantee of assuring that the wiring is replaced. It must be replaced every two decades. The illuminating body should be cleaned once in a month to maintain the value of maintenance. There's that P factor. What do I mean here? Because if you check light after a while, things clog in there and doesn't keep the same illumination like it should. The plinth protection around the building needs to be maintained properly so there may not be any passage for the surface water to percolate to the foundation and threaten its settlement. There may be installations like lifts and so on and this needs to be taken care of. 
Uh, sometimes, again, this happens when you are running, particularly a commercial building. The issue of servicing, maintenance contracts are rented into with firms who installed them. They do the maintenance job at regular intervals. Cleaning of the premises, compound, the building, including cutting and removal of unwanted plants, shrubs, and removal of garbage, are to be done at regular intervals to keep the area clean and pleasant. This is very key, especially during the COVID-19 days. I think, in a way, all things considered, post-COVID-19, you'll find, ideally, that our standards of hygiene will be higher. That, you know, people will wash their hands more regularly. Uh, it will become a routine to have your masks, although it might be uncomfortable. But if it's, it guarantees your safety and your health, or the safety and uh, your health of the family, it will be a good thing. It will not just improve the aesthetic sense of the occupier, but also they'll have a sense of responsibility and better living and induce good habits. I would like to talk a little bit about the issue of prevention. I mentioned it, but I think it's important that, because my understanding is that if you can conduct a, a risk analysis, you'll find that a lot, it costs, the English talk about some English language idiom. It says, a stitch in time saves nine. Even a shirt or a dress or whatever it is, if there's a small tear, and you fix it, it will cost you almost nothing. If you let it escalate, you might end up having to buy a, another shirt or another trouser or another something. So really, prevention is almost like common sense. But it's not always easy to inculcate that, particularly in our children. And they are going to stay home longer than usual, considering schools are closed until January. So one of the risks we are going to look at is there will be more traffic in the home, Many more, there'll be children are not allowed to go out easily, so they'll move around more in the home. They need to be supervised. They need to be given something to do, something that is creative, something that is will help them so they focus and not necessarily TV, you know. So I'm looking at how do we work on a routine of preventive it's actually like uh, what I would call public health, you know, sort of uh, um, prophylaxis, I think the word is prophylaxis, that you work on preventing rather than waiting for somebody to get unwell and then you treat them, which is very costly. That same analogy can come to a building. If in the fullness of time you've maintained your building the way it should be maintained, to the standards agreed, you find that, oh, here you are, you're building, somebody will ask, how old is this building? And you say it's 50 years old. It looks like it was built yesterday. Why? Because you've maintained it well. You've kept it going and so on. And here, when you're talking about prevention, sometimes this prevention starts even before the construction starts. Before the building starts, the soil investigation, collection of information about cl the climatic condition of the site, including possible seismic danger, and taking action by strengthening the structure according against all people of future eventualities fall under the preventive maintenance action plan. Unless this information is collected and the design is fed with these particulars, the structure would remain vulnerable to future incidents. Now during the construction, even when the above information is collected, done and so on, the structures are well designed, they may be susceptible to early decay due to lack of preventive measures during construction. So we are saying, on the one hand, you've prepared yourself. Then the construction starts and you think you are home and dry. No. You need to be assured and even have a tick box, a check box where you say, has this been taken care of? Is it meeting the standards we agreed? Is it meeting the compliance standards of the government? Because again, the government is the overseer of all this. So is it meeting those standards? Is it meeting the law? So preventive measures need during made during construction for ensuring quality and durability of the structure. Selection of right materials for construction and use those in proper way. What do I mean here? Use, get a properly trained technician or artisan. Because again, we've seen until recently, it seems as if the standards of training 
of our plumbers, our carpenters, our painters, our electricians had sort of collapsed. But I'm pleased to say that the government has come up with this notion called TVET, technical, uh, vocational training, and, and it's so, so important that young people learn that kind of education because we all can't be generals, you know. The capacity development in this country has just begun to take off in terms of training our citizens, our fundies, because it used to be there. During the colonial times, people went to school indeed and did academics, but they also learned to do work with their hands. Then at independence, somehow, I think perhaps because of uh, maybe the colonial factor, uh, people are replacing wazungus and so on, and saying mm, maybe this other job is not as important. Over time, it has proved that it is very, very important that we have people who understand the, 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 the characteristics of buildings, who appreciate the work, uh, um, workmanship, by engaging trained workmen, people who have this, not just certified, but who have actually gone through the mill in apprenticeship. So that when you hire a mason in your heart, you know you're hiring the best there is. Cement concrete is one of the main items which need the most preventive action to make it weatherproof, sound, and durable. Lime concrete, especially when it's used for providing waterproofing course over the reinforced concrete slab, needs preventive action so that things don't degenerate. I'll talk a little bit about the building environment components. And we have steel members which are used in building construction and remain exposed to weather and are susceptible to corrosion. Especially this, I noticed that in Mombasa a lot. State house, specifically. Those, we call them piers. There's no sort of like spears around the perimeter of the state house. You find because of the sea influence, we had actually, we used to paint them religiously every year but equally we also said after a certain period we need to replace them why because corrosion of the sea is so so severe and you can't run away from it another one is like timber used in building because in various ways is susceptible to early decay and decomposition this may be prevented by a right selection of timber again it needs to have matured the timber needs to mature or matured properly it needs to have been seasoned properly and it needs to be preserved. You know, there's something called wood preservative. So if you are taking timber, which will not warp because it's not matured, which will not crack, you're taking timber, taking it piece by piece so that you are comfortable that you're choosing the best material for building. Timber needs to, uh, from matured wood protected by seasoning, treating, and painting. And that's preventive early weather action. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, natural and man-made calamities. Let's start with the natural ones. I've talked about uh, 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 floods, I've also talked about drought and so on. But there's something that we need to work on. One is the Constitution of Kenya demands that people with disabilities must be catered for and buildings designed thus to assure that people of, with living disabilities are not inconvenienced because they too are citizens and so the constitution of Kenya is very clear on that. During the lifetime of the structure it may have to sustain certain natural calamities like earthquakes, like storms, like floods and how do we deal? We need to anticipate and we need to work on preventing that. Then there's of course the suitable preventive measures need to be incorporated in the design and construction to enable the structure to withstand all those, the earthquake, the storms, and the floods. But there's another phenomenon in town, the security, the terrorist, and we can't run away from that. Because uh, what's happening is, uh, they never, they don't give you a warning, they just look for soft spots where they can hit, and it's been done in the university, Garissa University, in, uh, in hotels, in everywhere. In fact, I'm just praying that as we are, you know, working on all this COVID-19 and so on, we don't get a hospital hit by terrorists. 
So sometimes the emphasis, and I observed this even when I was going to another building, not this one, that there's so much emphasis on checking your temperature and making sure that they don't even check your back to see if it's secure or not. So again, the issue of training. We need to train our guards to be clear of the fact that yes, indeed there's COVID-19, but also that there's a possibility of somebody sneaking in dangerous items, you know. So that, that takes training. I'd also like to talk a bit about uh, remedial maintenance. Now, we know that in spite of taking all preventive measures and providing routine maintenance, a structure may undergo decay and get damaged, which would require to be ameliorated by remedial measures. Due to some reasons, the structure may show signs of damage or stress. Remedial maintenance or repairs is removal of any decayed or damaged part of the structure or removal of any defect in the structure. Action for repairs or restoration work should be taken up without allowing increase of the possible defect causing further damage to the structure. So, we want, uh, uh, and we, want, we, we can't do it alone, we don't have the capacity yet, but we will work with the counties and the national government itself to assure that people know as we go into this, uh, the big four, building many, many houses, we want people to be uh, made aware, awareness campaigns, education, not for exam purposes, but for living, what I would call from learning to application. That people get to understand, yes, I'm going to this building, this house, and I know that it's my responsibility to take good care of it, because there lies my family, and that they need to be in good health. They need to, you know, to have no dust or other vices or vermin like rats and things like that. So that's an area of civic education that we are really working very hard to make sure that uh, over the fullness of time, all Kenyans will be entitled to proper information about every building, whether it's public or private. So when they go in there, they they are assured of their safety and comfort and convenience. But something else I might want to add here, there was an interesting case in the UK where somebody, a robber, actually dropped into a roof. Apparently the roof was not so strong. He fell in, injured himself, and sued the owner of the building. A robber sued the owner of the building for the damage of the injury. And I'm just wondering, in terms of law, that's a bit strange but it's a case that is celebrated. He didn't win, but he, this, this person had the presence of mind to want to sue for the damage, for the injury, rather than for the theft that he was going to do. Very interesting, a uh, piece of interest in there, but uh, we feel that uh, a lot of people in this country don't know their rights, so they can't invoke their rights. But having said that, also they need to have responsibility. Rights come with responsibility. They have a duty of care to others. They have a duty of care to, you know, to assure themselves that when things happen, they, they, they know what they're supposed to do. The Wanainchi are not taken by surprise. This whole thing about uh, Nyumbakumi sh should be ensconced in, in everywhere. So that people, a lot of people do things not because they, they want to harm anybody, but because they don't know better. So it's our duty as a board to make people know what they can do for themselves and for the neighbor. After all, we say you have to be your brother's or your sister's keeper in situations like this. You know, you are not, man is not an island, man or woman. We all live in a community. We need to take care of ourselves, but also we need to take care of our, our neighbors and somebody else. There's a third question here. What's the process of, uh, that's the fourth question. Where does the board uh, reside in the ministry? The board is uh, uh, directly under the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, uh, Housing, Urban Development, uh, and Public Works. It's a new board, uh, just so you know, and it was created with certain high benefit of hindsight in mind. First, it was a requirement that there be at least, that the board be a mix of public officers, public service officers, 
and private officers and even academia. So four from the private sector are on that board, people who practice privately. Four are from the government, people who work in the public service. And then uh, one, because it's four, four, one, one is um, from the academia. Because again, we know that this is a growing area. There will be a lot of things to pass around information, to share knowledge, and so on. So the board is necessarily put together that way so that we can pick, you know, from the various uh, experiences. At the same time, also build knowledge. It's all going to be what they call knowledge-based. Because we know that, for example, there will be what they call war for talent. And we want many more young people, young women, men and women, to get excited about joining the building surveying profession. It's a growth area. I mean, look at all these buildings. If you have to value them, we're looking at trillions and trillions of shillings, which can go to waste if it's not well taken care of. So I feel that uh, really the time has come. I feel that the Building Surveyors Registration Board has come at the right time. It's needed and it has a duty to the state, it has a duty to citizens of this country, and it has a duty to assure that the laws are maintained. We don't want a situation where when a building collapses, we rush there, when we should have prevented it. I think our aim is prevention, like they say, is better than cure. And we want to focus on prevention through education, through sensitization, through awareness, and making everybody believe that they have a duty of care for the other people. Yeah. And there could be another question. What is the process of doing maintenance and quality check for a building? Excellent. So, so that's a question. Because over time we've learned that there is a, a template that has been developed and we want to just revise it. But equally we have the, the building maintenance policy which also has a template that actually sort of like a checkbox. You know, what are the components? Are they in good condition? And there's a, a rundown where you'd say if it's one means is you know, not so good. Two, it's almost like fair. Three, it's good. Four, it's nice and acceptable. Five, it's in excellent condition. Zero, it means it's dangerous and it's not acceptable. So we have that kind of a checklist. And the, the point is, we want people to conduct inspections easily and conveniently for the occupant and the person who's doing the inspection. So they don't have to do second guessing. And plus, modern technology these days, there is technology, there is, uh, uh, equipment that help us to conduct a survey to ensure how, for example, we don't need two people to measure the, the area of a, of, a, of, a, of a room. There's a, a, a gadget which you use to measure that. Also, if it, in terms of measuring the moisture content of uh, soil, or the, you know, all those things, they have technology. And this technology is going to help a lot for people to do things conveniently and quickly. But all that requires enabling and empowering so that uh, everybody knows the score. So um, I've spoken far too much and uh, it's a time for feedback. I believe in the issue of criticism. I believe in feedback. I believe that all of us have something to offer to the universe because God creates no junk. So all of you, members of ISK, non-members, all of us live in some building. All of us work in some building. All of us operate somewhere. So we welcome feedback, welcome questions, welcome concerns, and the areas where you think or you feel we can improve. Because without your feedback, we can go on and on and on and still not meet the standards that are acceptable or that are required. So please, by all means, any questions and any concerns are welcome. And we are here to, as much as possible, address those concerns, those questions, those views. We don't believe that we have the monopoly of knowledge. We know that through hybridization, your ideas, our ideas, 
we can have a better Kenya. Thank you.